All right, so now I'm going to take folks through the uh, VOIP hurricane net. And um, as I'm pre prepping up the uh, slide here, um, how many folks in the room here have heard of the VOIP hurricane net and our operation? Okay, handful of folks. Um, so what I will be doing is walking through kind of the basics of our mission, um, what we do, some new things that we've been doing. We got a lot of questions about DSTAR, DMR. How are we doing those those things? We've been exploring that um, in the past year. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And I'm also going to talk about um, a couple of the major hurricanes, of course, from 2017 and 2018, and then remind folks about some of the best practices of of Skywarn that folks uh, should consider for their local area. This slide here is just a credit. I got a bunch of photos in here as part of the presentation deck, and um, I'll walk folks uh, through some of the photos that we've received and and give you guys a sense of what some of these hurricanes uh, uh, do in a, in a given area. So our mission is, of course, to support WX4NHC with real-time or near real-time measured weather data and damage reports. And we use the Skywarn reporting criteria. So um, I know it's a little variable but from area to area, but uh, really the Skywarn reporting criteria is what we use. And you say, well, doesn't the Weather Service get the reports to the Hurricane Center? Well, they do, but it depends on how quickly they're able to put out a local storm report and such. So a lot of times it's great to have both the local National Weather Service office and the Hurricane Center informed at the same time because you're basically going to get the information to all the sources as quickly as you can. Uh, we, we have an ability for uh, make EOCs, weather service offices, and the Hurricane Center come together through our, our network. Um, we can also liaison directly into uh, net, nets that may be local that have Echolink and IRLP access if the local folks are okay with that. Um, and we also disseminate the advisories and updates just like they do on the Hurricane Watch Net. Uh, we are on star WX underscore talk star Echolink conference and IRLP 9219. And we have a variety of backup systems if the network goes down. Uh, we activate certainly when WX4 NHC is uh, up and running. Uh, there are times where we've actually self-activated. These have been cases where a tropical storm suddenly intensifies into a hurricane. One that I remember very vividly was in 2005 with Hurricane Emily. And what was worse, it was in the, it was in the middle of the night. We had activation plans ready to go, and then it looked like Emily wasn't going to intensify. We canceled everything. And then four hours later, I got home from some meetings and found we had a hurricane on our hands again. And it was affecting Trinidad and Tobago and a couple of the other Caribbean islands. And we actually stayed up through the night, gathered information uh, from the Grenadines and, and Grenada and some other areas. This is at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning, and there were hams up giving these reports. Got the reports in. Uh, Went to bed about 5 a.m., woke up the next morning and saw an AP article with one of the reports that uh, we had given to the Hurricane Center. So sometimes, you know, we, again, as Bobby pointed out, never let your guard down. These things can do some pretty strange things, um, and that's what happened there. So um, we self-activate as needed. If a, a local group is interested in using our network and our resources, uh, we can self-activate in, in that uh, manner as well. Uh, our, again, we, t we talked about our network. It's on all the time. It's always operational, and we have backup systems as well that we can use. Um, our net management team watches the tropics, the tropical weather outlooks, the tropical uh, dis special tropical disturbance statements and such. When we get um, some of those products and we're concerned about something that may uh, form into a tropical storm or hurricane and then maybe later affect a land area, we're uh, getting on. We're getting on to our email group and putting out the information, trying to get folks to, um, notified that things could be happening. Uh, when it gets close to land areas and and it's uh, at near or, or above hurricane strength, we're checking in with Julio. When are you going to activate? We'll coordinate our activation. Mentioned some one of the examples: Hurricane Emily, where we had that sudden intensification. Another example is Hurricane uh, uh, Tomas in 2010 where we had a lot of reports and, and, and Julio was able to have an operator at the Hurricane Center collect those reports and get them into the forecasters. And that was another case where a system uh, intensified uh, unexpectedly. We do use our, our chat programs, one of the ones that we are using now very um, uh, exclusively for our net management team and our net controls is a program called Telegram. It's a phone app. It's also a desktop 
a PC program uh, that you can use. So there's a number of different ways uh, to be able to access that um, from a chat perspective. Um, you know, and we try to prepare participants across the, and, and we're always looking for folks along the Atlantic and Gulf Coast of the U.S., the Caribbean islands, which we've had some luck with over the years to gather reports, Mexico, Central America, always looking for those stations to uh, come in and check in with us, give us their reports, guide them on criteria, and get that information into the National Hurricane Center. Um, Joe mentioned Darnett earlier. Uh, we meet monthly here in the non-hurricane season months at uh, Saturday evenings at 8 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central. Uh, uh, we then scale it up to weekly during the hurricane season months of June through November. Uh, and then in December with the Sky One Recognition Day event, we, we back up the net one hour prior to kind of round out the uh, Sky One Recognition Day with our, our last net of the year. Uh, and that's when we shift back into uh, monthly nets. Great way to ask technical questions. We sometimes offer weather training topics, good for net control practice. Um, our activations run quite a bit differently than the regular nets, but it's still good practice of net control work gets also good practice to especially new amateurs who have never checked into a net before or never checked into a digital type of net before. So it, it's just a great way to get some practice in and to talk to people and build those relationships ahead of the actual uh, tropical system or hurricane impacting you. Our website is voipwx.net. We just switched it over to a WordPress type of site uh, a little over a year ago. Um, I think there's more that we can do with the website as time goes on to kind of pretty it up, but um, a lot of the data and, and resources are there. Um, as far as technical information, it's always good to check out your audio before you check into the net. You can um, use the echo test server and there's an IRLP node um, that you can basically do a, a test to check your audio levels and such. One of the other things is to disable Echolink conferencing because in the program, if you first install it, that is actually on by default. And we actually have a script that kills that because if somebody else connects to you, it can cause unintentional interference, interference you didn't mean to have and the station that connects to you didn't mean to cause. So we tell folks to disable conferencing and we have a script if it senses it's enabled or somebody connects to you, it's gonna automatically knock you off. And we're not doing that to be mean, <laughs> we're just doing it to keep interference down. Um, there are ways to eliminate repeater IDs and courtesy tones or squelch tails over the network. Um, we have a, a, a resource within our team, Tony Langdon, that can help with that. But um, even talking with Fred, because he had this uh, question, um, I have some local folks that also know how to do some of this work. Uh, there's been the All-Star Network on VOIP, and we've had connect connectivity into the All-Star Network um, through Echolink. So again, another digital mode that um, we're able to utilize and, and connect into. A lot of folks have asked us about DSTAR and DMR. What are we doing with it? Are we doing anything with it? Um, Lloyd Colston, KC5FM, who's actually our public information officer and actually heavily involved in emergency management in Oklahoma, actually did a lot of work on this for us last year. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that because even though I have a lot of DMR equipment and some DSTAR equipment, it's one of those things, you get the equipment, you don't have the time, and then when you have the time, you don't have the money to get the equipment. Kind of one of those uh, situations. Um, but uh, he was able to get a, a, a establish a, a DMR and DSTAR uh, network um, through the QuadNet folks, through Jeff Bishop VE6DV. Uh, we kind of had it as a separate network, and we kind of would listen in on it at, at, at times. Um, during Hurricane Michael, we actually were able to connect it in um, through Echolink on DMR. Uh, and I think we also did that for Sky One Recognition Day as well. Now there's some question of whether we can still do that, not so much from a technical perspective, but just the purest of the digital piece um, that's within DMR and DSTAR versus connecting into the analog piece is, is a question. But it, I think it'd be really good if we can have these modes kind of all coexist and, and connect to one another particularly for emergency situations. Um, we have the digital modes, they have their place. We have analog modes that everybody has. Um, digital, the problems I think with DMR and DSTAR isn't that the modes aren't good, I think they're very good, but you need a special radio for it. So it'd be great to connect them all together because we only have so many net control resources. You know, one of the things Julio mentioned, that's why he relies on the Hurricane Watch Net and the VOIP Hurricane Net to help funnel in the data to him. So this is work that we're doing. We're gonna see what the new year brings um, in this area and 
I have to make a commitment myself to get uh, more involved. Again, it's not that I don't have the equipment. It's just getting the time to kind of practice and work with uh, some of these modes and uh, see what we can do to either integrate it into Echolink and IRLP or also uh, monitor them uh, independently if, if required as well. So now I'm going to walk through some of our major hurricane net activations of the last two years, basically since the last time we were in uh, New Orleans. So this was Hurricane Harvey. And if you look, the biggest story was the flooding, but there were some big wind gusts. There were a number of online weather stations that we were able to gather info from before they went down. They had wind gusts over 100 miles an hour, the highest of which was 117 miles per hour in Rockport, Texas, and 112 miles per hour in Tivoli, Texas. And there were over 50 inches of rain in the Houston, Texas, and Beaumont, Port Arthur's, and Graves, Texas area. It was really three disasters, the actual landfall of the hurricane, the winds and the rains with that, then the flooding first in the Houston area, and then the Beaumont, Port Arthur, Graves, Texas area. And that's what happens with these hurricanes. Harvey stalled. You're going to hear that theme again when we, we cover Florence quickly. And that caused a whole other additional component uh, that could affect Aries, could affect Skywarn, um, getting active in those situations, reporting into your local weather service office as well as the Hurricane Center until the hurricane uh, weakened uh, to below uh, hurricane status. Uh, just to, you know, it was definitely what started off this kind of chain of major hurricane landfalls um, over the last couple of years. And then and there was Hurricane Irma, which essentially destroyed the island of Barbuda. They had a measured wind gust of 155 miles per hour before the instrument failed. You know, one of the things that's happened in the last couple of years is we've seen, I've seen more weather station wind instruments fail than I've ever seen probably in the last 15, 20 years. Um, in St. Martin's in, in Anguilla, uh, amateur radio operator who has a weather station at the Anguilla Department of Disaster Management. He wasn't on our frequency, but he had a weather station online that we could poll. And we polled it and we were able to get information from it with its highest sustained wind of 82 miles per hour with a gust to 117 miles per hour before that instrument failed. Uh, and then in the U.S. Virgin Islands, um, again, another online station that um, wasn't online for much longer after a 113-mile-an-hour wind gust before it failed. So these were data points that we were giving to the Hurricane Center, to Julio, that were then appearing at times in Hurricane Center advisories. And then you see the photos here. So some of the photos from the Virgin Islands, from the um, uh, uh, St. Martin here, uh, these photos, these are some of the first photos that we actually were able to get from amateurs before the cell network went down. One photo in particular was from Brett Ruiz, who had family in St. Martin. We got those photos, sent them to Julio, put it out on social media. Went, I'd never seen anything go so viral because it was the only s sources of information they were getting from the islands. And it, it, so pretty amazing. So this is an example of us as amateur operators using our amateur radio skills, then using what infrastructure is up, when it's up, to get some additional information. And then when that infrastructure goes down, okay, we don't have it, but we're still doing things and providing information that and a lot of times other resources are, are thirsting for and then uh, uh, ultimately are, are, are unable to, to obtain from any other method. Then the second landfall of Irma was uh, in Florida. So again, the 133 mile an hour wind gust, um, with, you know, Julio spoke to this and um, I was actually watching that weather station online because it was in a fortified structure and Julio was at that shelter, very busy. He had his operators at the hurricane center. He was very busy handling things there at the, at the shelter. And later in that day, I'd submitted the report and everything, but uh, he, he was very busy. He came back, hey, what was that high wind gust again? You know, I, I need that information. I had it at my fingertips to give to, to Julio. So um, just an example of how having multiple eyes in different places is, is helpful, especially eyes outside of the, uh, uh, the affected area. Very helpful. There was all the rainfall, all of the uh, damage, especially to trees and wires. There were multiple cranes blown over in uh, Miami, Florida. And then you can see the, the damage photos again from amateur operators from different parts of, uh, of Florida. And some of it was structural, as you can see here. Luckily, Irma weakened quite a bit before it went through um, Florida. It weakened quite a bit after the landfall in Cuba. So it really kept the, uh, the uh, situation uh, there um, a bit less than what it could be. But nonetheless, Julio had structural damage at his home. 
a lot of structural damage and trees and wires in much of, of Florida that took a long time to recover from. And then there was Hurricane Maria. And with Maria in Dominica, well, we had a number of reports, and one of the cases we got reports from several amateurs in Dominica was an amateur operator in St. Lucia was in contact on VHF to Dominica. He then got the reports and then gave it to us up on Echolink. It was J69DS that gave us that information. And we had a number of reports there. We had a number of reports um, even from social media. We, we were intercepted a report there that the prime minister's palace was severely damaged. He was okay, but the palace was damaged. And then as it went into Puerto Rico, long time check into our net, November Papa Three Oscar Delta Francisco gave us these just a couple of photos right in his uh, uh, home area of San Juan. And you can see the, the damage here. He lost all of his antennas. He still had some Echolink access, though he would eventually lose that access and cell phone access. Um, but we were getting a lot of reports from him, and we had an amateur operator in the New York City area who had uh, contact through uh, uh, his, his uh, I think it was a broadcast radio station where he was getting phone calls from Puerto Rico. He was taking that information and then giving that to us on our net and was a, responsible for a number of the reports that we got from, from Puerto Rico. So. This is how the whole amateur radio thing and different things that we can do here help so much with gaining ground truth and, and situational awareness. Of course, there was the Force of 50 mission and all of the work that was done there from the amateurs that deployed for several weeks in the recovery effort. There was 50 amateurs lined up, 22 or so actually did the deployment. Um, a bunch of information is available online there, and we have recordings of some of our reports, both from Dominica and Puerto Rico, um, on these YouTube links that you can check out. One of them was actually picked up by the New York Times and actually turned into an electronic uh, article crediting amateur radio for what it was doing and then also talked about some of the recovery efforts in Dominica. Coming back into 2018, there was Hurricane Florence, and Florence was a Category 1 hurricane, but it kind of pulled a Harvey or a mini Harvey with about three feet of rain and such that folks have already talked about. These are a couple photos, again, from an amateur radio operator out of the Lumberton and Fayetteville, North Carolina areas. That's some pretty serious flooding, especially you know, water almost up through an entire light pole. This is really serious flooding from the rivers and streams and the heavy rainfall. And there was a number of wind damage reports. One of the wind damage reports I definitely won't, won't forget it was in the Sneeds Ferry area where we had an amateur operator in New England whose son was stationed at the Marine Base in Sneeds Ferry. And he was giving us reports from his son who was uh, stationed there uh, and we were giving those reports into the, to the Hurricane Center. And then a couple of other amateurs had contacts with a couple of the storm chasers who were also sending us in information from Eastern North Carolina during Florence. So it was very good to have that connectivity to folks. There was even a water rescue situation that an amateur learned from, had information on through a relative in the area where we actually followed up with the public safety re first responders in the area. And they were happy to get the call because they were, they were working through a list of people being rescued and they prioritized them because they knew that the call had been outstanding for some period of time, but that person was still in trouble. And they, I believe that person was safely rescued. So you never know where the emergency calls sometimes are going to come from, and that's why we have so many different networks to, to uh, perform these missions. And then there was Hurricane Michael. And I remember Michael for one thing. It was a really quiet hurricane net. And everybody's like, well, where are all the reports? Where are the people, et cetera? We did have a few weather stations that we got wind gust reports as high as uh, 130 miles per hour before we could not con uh, connect with those weather stations anymore. Uh, I saw a few amateur, weather, amateur radio weather stations online, and I decided, well, let me email one of the guys. You never know. Maybe the, the station's still reporting, and he's at his home, and he could send us an email or get on and give us a, a report. Well, this photo right here is what happened to his weather station. <laughs> so, so basically, we got the email that said, um, my station was destroyed. And this is the kind of, I mean, we were basically from a wind, there was the storm surge, and, and I think Bobby did a good job with his photos capturing that. But there was tremendous wind damage here, basically the equivalent of wind damage of a high-end EF2 or EF3 tornado. 
around the center of that eye. People had to take cover. They couldn't report in, not to mention the damage to all of the infrastructure. So a quiet net in this case pro really probably meant that folks were taking cover. Through the efforts of Dennis Durr at K2DCD, who he was in the uh, Bay County area. Dennis is one of our net management team members. These are some of the photos of some of the damage. I mean, I mean, if you look at the damage of these structures and trees, right? This is like tornadic damage, high-end tornadic damage. So very hard to um, get get reports um, when it's you know it's it's hard enough in a tornado which lasts you know you know 30 to 60 seconds to a couple of minutes. It's even worse when you're under maybe an hour or two of these types of winds because it's going to do this kind of damage. And you know you're in real trouble when the uh, Booze Express is not selling booze anymore because of the damage. So just some damage photos from Hurricane Michael, a very serious Category 5 hurricane, and some explanation of, because even our net controls were like, geez, the net is so quiet, where is everybody? Well, everybody was likely taking cover because they had to. That was the kind of winds they were experiencing. So one of the other things I want to talk about, and I know the, the local group here has been doing uh, some work with Zello, is there's other forms of technology that we can use. Not so much to communicate with each other as amateur radio operators, right? We have our amateur frequencies, and yeah, I'm sure we use our cell phones and some of the apps to do some communication, you know, chats, like I mentioned, like Telegram. But I know that uh, Zello is an app that um, I know uh, Joe promotes here locally and even does a net on. And it's probably not that important for us as the amateurs to be using it, though that's fine as another vehicle to do things. But what does Zello give us? An ability to contact non-amateurs. That's, I think, very important because for a couple of reasons. We might get information from them that we can go vet and, and you know, we talk to uh, our, our Skyworn spotters that are not amateur radio operators. Zello could be a means to talk to them. And then who knows, you start working with them there, do they get their amateur radio license? You know, they, these are things we have to consider is how do we expand our reach to non-amateurs and maybe we're working with them there, but then eventually we get them into our ranks as amateur radio operators. I think that's something we really uh, need to look at and consider. And there's a lot of chat programs, WhatsApp, Telegram, Slack, um, there's Google Hangouts, there's, there's too many to list, but there's a number of those that I know probably some amateurs use and certainly a, a lot of folks that aren't amateur radio operators use to communicate on their phones and when it's available it's great. And I know we're not going to have it all the time, but it is a way I think for us to again reach out to non-hams and maybe get them to become hams and show them, hey when this goes down or if you don't have access to certain things here or if you're in your car driving, it's a little bit easier to pick up a mic on a radio than it is to pick up your phone or to try to text while you're driving and all of those sorts of things. So something to consider about how we use some of these other uh, tools, uh, technology. Um, you know, and, and obviously we have the technical experience to know when these things are going to work well, when they're not, and we can structure the voice communications like a net and, and teach people how to, to communicate because I think we have a lot of folks that use these apps and they don't know how to do the radio communications like we do, which makes it more difficult. That's something that we can bring uh, to some of the folks in, in some of these areas. Um, our net is really kind of turned into like a virtual communication situational awareness support system. Um, I've even taken some of our reports that I haven't seen get to local weather service offices and have put them in. I've been always been a little nervous about that because they don't necessarily know me that yet I'm the coordinator out in the Norton Mass office, but they don't really know me in their local area. But I found the weather service office is very receptive to the information we receive from, um, is provided we have the specific data, where it's coming from and such, they're very receptive to getting this data. I've seen them use it in their storm reports. So um, if we have access to people or, or, or information that isn't being sent in locally, we've sent in some of this information and it's, and it's worked out pretty well. Again, provided we have the direct source. You know, There's a lot of weather stations online, you can't monitor them all. A lot of them don't have criteria information, but some of them do. And as long as they fit in with a lot of the other area that you're, you're getting data from, there's, there's a lot of good information to, to coalesce there. So it's, again, just providing that centralized hub of information. That's one thing I think amateur radio can do in addition to when communications fail. 
because um, I think we have to get agencies to use us when the communications aren't failing as, as kind of another auxiliary, as another way to gather and centralize data so that when things fail, we're already in position. It, I'm nervous that just especially, you know, in my area, New England, we haven't had, you know, a major hurricane enough to wipe out communications uh, in a long time. So there's a lot of complacency, I think, about that aspect. But they do understand how much information we can collect from them um, during weather situations. So I'm hoping that eventually is the avenue that if and when we get a big one in New England, we'll be there for the, the, the all else fails types of, of missions. A number of the preparations for 2019, a lot of the same things we talk about every year. We're always looking for net controls. Um, we've done a good job adding a lot more listen-only capability. We'll be ready for the WX4 NHC communications test when Julio has that scheduled as a yearly thing. Um, we have not done the net control training, and that's something that um, we, we, we need to push amongst our folks. And we're, again, we're always looking for folks in the affected areas across all of the coastlines. Uh, the U.S. coast, Central America, Caribbean, uh, all areas to provide that information into the Hurricane Center and other agencies. Um, you know, we're, we're continuing to work on kind of being that virtual communications hub. And then the last couple of slides here is just about, just a reminder from a Skywarn perspective, we're talking a lot about hurricanes. Tropical storms can cause a lot of damage, severe weather, flooding, especially if they stall out over an area. Um, even though our net may not be active, WX4NHC, the Hurricane Watch Net, it's very important for you guys to monitor that for your, your local uh, National Weather Service offices. Um, some of these storms can cause impacts as, as great as Category 1 hurricanes. I remember in 2016, and I talked about this in the conference here two years ago, all the flooding in Baton Rouge, all of the, 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 the issues with the heavy rainfall and the impacts that that caused and the Aries activations to support Red Cross and supporting the Weather Service with the flooding reports and, and rainfall reports. There are a lot of other systems that, um, that occur that are pretty significant that may not reach the level of getting hurricane networks activated that the local and regional um, Aries and Skywarn coordinators uh, should be uh, dealing with. So. Just um, based on kind of those examples, um, just make sure you're, you're, you're prepared at home for in those situations. And while it may not be a true communications emergency or maybe it can eventually get to that, don't be complacent that tropical storms, tropical depressions are just systems that, are, that, that happen, you know, severe weather outbreaks and such can cause damage that really requires robust Aries and Skywarn support. Um, it's a great way to provide situational awareness. It, it, it can, you know, it can get noticed by the media, which then promotes how important amateur radio is. And it's a force multiplier effect. You know, amateur radio, in terms of uh, it's there when all else fails, it's another form of social media. And sometimes we're really good at, at creating our own social media and managing the modern social media and kind of debunking what's really good information and what's not so good information. So something that, to keep in mind, and then again, allows us to be there if a situation deteriorates when all communications fail and we get into a communications emergency. These are our resources on Echolink and IRLP for folks that are interested. I mentioned our website. There's also our Facebook and Twitter VOIP WXNet feeds that um, Lloyd Colston does an excellent job of maintaining. We switched our email list to Groups IO from Yahoo Groups. Um, Yahoo Groups was just kind of getting long in the tooth. The Groups IO has worked out really well, and it's a, it was an easy migration process. Um, and we can help with any kind of technical questions as well um, through these resources and by contacting us. Uh, our contact information, mine's up here along with several others. I'll, I'll mention um, a change here that we have Debbie Gray, WX9VOR, who's one of our assistant directors of operations for the VOIP Hurricane Net. She, um, She's done a tremendous job for us with both um, being a net control operator. She's helped us recruit some hams from her area to help with the hurricane net. Uh, in addition, um, uh, Debbie uh, f had filled some very big shoes for us because last year we lost um, Jim Sellers, N0UAM, and, and, and Julio remembers Jim. He was one that uh, was on our net um, tirelessly during activations provided a lot of reports, monitored different weather stations and such, particularly in the 2017 hurricane season. We lost him to a uh, long uh, illness uh, that he was fighting 
uh, in the spring of last year, and we did a, a special uh, last call for him uh, on the WX4NHC communications test. We were very saddened to lo lose Jim. He was also very active in his local Skywarn community in, in southwest Missouri. We were very lucky to have Debbie come in and, and step in and, and take uh, on uh, uh, that responsibility, and we'll likely be adding uh, another person into our net management team over uh, uh, the next month or two, but we'll leave that uh, as a as a as an item that you'll see over email on our website uh, uh, in the coming weeks.